There is no word that covered how scared we were. Sleep with your clothes on, have your shoes half tied. And the shrapnel all comes down on top of you. And I was just one of the fortunate ones that survived. I certainly, you know, learned to appreciate life a lot more. Our attitude was, you know, we have the opportunity to, to make the world uh, free. Welcome to Medal and Honor, the greatest generation. For the next hour, we will hear from Wisconsin veterans who served their country proudly during our nation's most prolific military conflict, World War II. These men and women put their lives on the line every day in Europe and in the Pacific, and the stakes couldn't have been higher. Our freedom and the American way of life. Medal and Honor is part of the Milwaukee County War Memorial Center's Veteran Story Project an oral history of Wisconsin servicemen and women designed to recognize their courage and sacrifice and the importance of having the War Memorial Center renovated to be a fitting home for their stories, a vital part of our state's history. Wisconsin soldiers were connected to some of the most iconic moments of World War II. Joe Demmler was captured by the Germans on the Belgium and Luxembourg border and was put to work on the railroads. As a prisoner of war, Joe suffered through an unimaginable ordeal and became a national figure for his incredible sacrifice. He was on the cover of Life magazine as the human skeleton. Our diet was made of, of uh, uh, a pound of cheese to 10 guys. And, and uh, so, and then we, we had this German bread. This bread was made from, from uh, rye flour, flour, sawdust, leaves, and straw. And that, that's, that was our diet, diet. Some days, some days we didn't even get fed. And that's, that's where I, I lost uh, the weight and, and I contacted pneumonia, and I had no, no uh, doctor care. Then uh, we, we uh, water, we didn't have any water. The only water we had is what we ate, the snow. Snow we had, we had no bathroom facilities. But the, the clothes I had on, I didn't have off in three months. Months, the socks spread, uh, rotted on my feet my feet, but I, I'm one of the fortunate ones. I survived five, the majority of, of them that were with me perished, perished. And uh, you, you couldn't escape, escape if you would have tried first place. You didn't have the strength, strength from the diet that we had, that had to be able to, to get through. Then when uh, we, we finally got the railroad repaired, they were going to take us to Limburg, so they, they piled us in, in railroad cars. We were in there, it might be four days, five days, I have no way of knowing. They didn't feed us on those four or five days, days at all. We were locked in. I, I stood on the top of a, one, of the, one of our dead soldiers, soldiers, because there was no room to move. Move for so when when I got got to Limburg, Berg, we we had we got finally got some some uh, rations from from the Red Cross, Red Cross. But uh, most of us by that time time had had passed on, on, and I was just one of the fortunate ones that survived. You were down to seventy pounds. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah, my, I remember when it, when I was liberated, the little hundred pound nurse nurse lifted me off the gurney and put me in bed. I I would have lived. They figured that I would have lived about three days. I had pneumonia. Part part of my lung lung 
had had I had over four liters of pus pus in my lung, and I had I had uh, uh, part of part of my my lung had grown tight on the bottom on on the bottom of my and it, it, I have never gotten the, the full full uh, lung back of of capacity again. When I was liberated, liberated, uh, John Forno, he 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 was a, uh, a photographer. Uh, he he was for life and for uh, I think he was for United United Press. So uh, he he took pictures of us that that uh, they appeared. They, they didn't only appear in life, they appeared in, in uh, uh, Stars and Stripes uh, paper. And I've been in every paper, I believe, in the world. In the world, I've, I've, uh, I've, I've only met him that one time, and I've, I feel bad that I never ha had an opportunity again to meet him, to meet him, but, uh, because he died here a couple of years ago, so um, I've, I've had so many interviews and stuff that I that I'm, I'm probably the most publicized. Sized, uh, in fact, when I was in Memphis in the in the hospital, I was the most publicized veteran there. Did you ever think I'm not going to make it? It just seems no, amazing. You can't have a defeated attitude. You got you. You got, you got to think positively, and that's how my life has always been. I always think, think of, of what the good things, and and the, I take care. That's why I take very good care of myself. If you had a defeated attitude, dude, you 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 wouldn't last very long. Me, I I thank the Lord every day, I, and I always I always pray for for all the guys that 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 perished, perished and, and the suffering. Bill Holmes was also captured in Europe, shot down in a bombing mission where he too suffered during nine months as a prisoner of war. So we can see these Messerschmitts, and oh boy, here it comes, so I make sure your guns are all set. And we finally figured out what they were doing. They were talking to the anti-aircraft people on the ground, telling them our airspeed and our altitude to make them more accurate. And believe me, they were. Because <laughs> they got us, they hit us in the number two engine, which is also right on the wing where you fill, the fill pipe for the uh, gas is right there also. And I looked out, I had a window I, so I could, because the pilot, they can't, when the, your razor, they can't see the gear. That was also one of my jobs, gear down, lock, gear up and lock. So I looked out there and I see all this water. <laughs> so I called back to the waste. I said, do you see anything? He said, yeah. I said, that ain't water. I said, don't light a match, that's 100 octane. Don't even. So, of course, <laughs> you don't go far without <laughs> So we, rather than take a chance of the thing blowing up, we jumped. Bill was captured by the Germans after his parachute got caught in some trees. We march off to solitary, and that is scary. The cells are not very big, needless to say. Well, you might go a day or two without any food. Well, I, came, I weighed 90 pounds when I came out. And uh, you might go a day or two out, and then sometimes the food was so bad that, yeah, it would be old bread or something like that. Was, but like you see, you might go a day or two without anything. But I would never forget one. When they, Patton came and liberated our camp, that was something. He came in on, on a tank with his ivory handled pistols. <laughs> And, well, he was, was he a hero? It was certainly an experience I'll never forget. But it's like I told you, you should learn something from everything that happens. And 
you can tolerate a lot more than you think you can. Most people think the war ended after the bombing of Nagasaki, but there were many American air missions carried out after that. Henry Ratensky was on the very last bombing mission of World War II. And now we're coming back from our last mission. I mean, we were over Iwo Jima. I mean, they, that's, so we traveled 800 miles to Iwo Jima from, the, you know, from Japan. We still had 800 more miles to go four more hours before our war was over, but Truman got on a Saipan radio and, and, and announced that the war is over. And what day, of the, what day was this? That would, have been, uh, that would have been the morning of August the 15th, 1945. Okay. That, that's the surrender day. Okay. And so this was after the atomic bomb, obviously. Uh, yeah, the, uh, the, the atomic bombs were dropped on, the first one was August the 6th. I mean, say, uh, at, at 8.15 in the morning. Now, what people, people think that when we dropped the bomb, the war was over. I mean, that's, uh, see, but, uh, but after that, we had another atomic bomb. We had 1,600 additional B-29 missions after, Nagasa after Hiroshima. So there's 1,000, to be exact, 1,596 additional B-29 bomb loads were dropped on Japan after the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. Milwaukee's Ed Islandfeld was directly involved with the story that perhaps best sums up the courage and bravado of the American military in the European theater. It's a story from the Battle of the Bulge that has been related many times in books and in the Academy Award winning motion picture Patton. It is a story summed up by one unforgettable word, a story that Ed told to his family when they interviewed him at his home in 2004. Oh, then we were up in Bastogne there, and then the Germans surrounded us up there. And we were surrounded for 10 days. And then that's when they sent us this letter to... Surrender? Surrender. The assistant division commander, who was General Tony McAuliffe, was in command. When the Germans asked us to surrender, McAuliffe read it, uh, read it and he said, I'm nuts. And he said, what am I going to answer? And then this general, uh, no, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Danny says, oh, why don't you tell him nuts? He said, okay, and then I was sergeant, or he says, sergeant, put a sheet of paper in your typewriter, uh, write this to a commanding general, uh, to the commanding general of the army, a German army. Nuts, put it in capital letters and then sign it the American commander. So I did. I never think anything further of it. And uh, then this German emissary, whoever brought the message over, took it back and that's how things started. Well, we waited and waited because they were going to annihilate us with, I don't know how many cores of uh, German artillery and Panzer divisions and so forth. So we sat kind of tight in Bastogne there waiting for it to come and then, uh, and what do you know, that's when the weather broke. We were covered with clouds all the time. But not a, I think it was the day after Christmas. The weather broke and the uh, Air Corps P-47s and P-51s came in. P-47 guys came in and they just literally destroyed those tanks. Blew them up the box. When Douglas MacArthur waded on shore in the Philippines Islands in October of 1944, he fulfilled his promise to return to the Philippines in an historic moment. 
Milwaukee's Neyland Cohen saw it happen. I saw MacArthur walk ashore. Our ship was on the beach at uh, Leyte, and a fellow from the other ship uh, yelled over to no one in particular. I was standing uh, a bow watch. Uh, the uh, uh, ensign and I were standing a bow watch, and this guy yelled over, hey, MacArthur's walking ashore. So like fools, we ran over there. None of us saluted. And we saw MacArthur walk ashore. Why didn't you salute? It, it didn't think of it. We were so in awe of what we saw. We didn't think of saluting. No one said anything either. Many Wisconsin veterans served in the Pacific. Now we're going to meet two vets who fought in one of the bloodiest battles in American history at Iwo Jima. As American forces would soon discover, more than 22,000 Japanese troops literally burrowed underneath the surface, establishing an elaborate and unprecedented underground defense. Clayton Chipman was one of the soldiers whose job it was to somehow find a way to penetrate that defense. Can't run into anybody that would say they weren't scared. They were all scared beyond the English language. There is no word that covered how scared we were. And uh, we got up to an open area that went into this five or six area football field, pillbox on the bottom of the hill, and five caves in the end of a, of a um, end of the airport. So when the tank went in to work on the pillbox, I went to close those caves and throw the hand grenades up over my head and into the opening of the caves. And uh, if you are familiar with a hand grenade, it takes a little effort to throw it. And uh, I threw it in four to five caves. And uh, the last cave was full of, of um, Japanese sea bags, and I emptied a, a magazine from an automatic rifle in there in case someone was hiding behind it. Well, when that was done, I looked for the guys that sent me in, and they were gone. I ran past the tank and hit up against the pillbox because I knew the Japs were going to send someone else in to uh, fire out. But my emotions took over and I wasn't thinking. I knew and everybody else knew that the Japs were going to shell the tank. Well, when some of the shells hit the tank, a piece went through my shoulder. And uh, th then uh, uh, that was about how I got wounded. I, I made a foolish mistake. To this day, uh, I feel that uh, the Lord has given me a guardian angel, and he's kept me out of trouble. Greg Gabriel was also in the line of fire at Iwo Jima, part of his service in the Pacific in the late stages of the war. We got battle stars because at Iwo and at Okinawa because we were there before the islands were declared secure. And uh, when we got to Iwo, uh, we were under air attacks a couple of times when we got to Okinawa. The kamikazes uh, were in action there. And uh, I think I spent the summer of 1945 with my clothes on because we, they were up at general quarters two, three, four times a night. The Japs happened to know exactly the range of our radar, and they would send in a couple of planes just to, for aggravation. And uh, uh, sleep with your clothes on, ha have your shoes half tied so you could just j jump into them and get up at general quarters. We sometimes did that three, four times a night. And uh, so we were under attack. My assignment on the ship and general quarters was on one of the main batteries. It was, it was a quad 40 millimeter. and. Uh, we had to stand at it, uh, stand there until all clear came.
Guadalcanal was the first major offensive against Japan and a turning point in that phase of the war. The Americans were victorious there, but success did not come easily. The Marines had landed on August the uh, 7th uh, on the canal in 42, and we came up, uh, the squadron came up sort of piecemeal. Um, our group came up about two and a half to three weeks after the initial landing. The initial landing was unopposed, uh, but by the time that uh, the troops got in there and we started uh, continuing to finish the airstrip that the Japanese had built, was starting to build, we, um, uh, there had been fireworks. Uh, the Japs wanted that field back, and they were doing everything possible to do that. So there was bombing and strafing and shelling, and therefore they put everything, in every force that they could possibly put in there to take us. And um, by the, the grace of God, the, uh, the Grunt Marines, the most honorable of all the machine gunners and the, uh, uh, the howitzer uh, guys, the, uh, they, they kept that perimeter from being uh, broken, and which saved, which was very beneficial to us continuing to operate off the airfield. And you weren't by yourself. You were surrounded by a lot of your uh, fellow, the fellow Marines that were probably 10 times more Marine than you were. Some of the finest guys you'd ever want to meet in your life were, were those guys. They, um, uh, we ended up on, um, on Guadalcanal. A key to American military success in Asia was keeping the supply chain open to support Chinese troops who were fighting the Japanese and to support American Air Force bases that were based in China. Joe Berstecki, whose entire family was heavily involved in the war, flew the infamous Hump Route thousands of miles over the Himalayas, over China, Burma, and India. The longest mission we flew was to Singapore, and we were in the air for over 17 hours. Uh, the the B-29 had two bomb bays, one forward and one rear, and the forward bomb bay we carried extra fuel tanks. And in the rear bomb bay, we carried uh, four 1,000-pound bombs. And we hit a, uh, a floating dry dock that the British had built before the war and anchored in, off Singapore to service their Navy in that part of the world. But the Japanese, of course, took over and they were repairing their ships, fighting our Navy. So we were sent down to destroy the, the uh, dry dock. And we did sink it. Some of the most compelling stories from World War II came from the survivors, the troops who stormed the beach at Normandy on D-Day. Milwaukee's Bob Peshman was on a boat in English waters for three days when his unit finally got the order to attack. Omaha Beach got really hit. They lost a couple thousand guys. I would say we were nothing but bodies thrown to fill the holes. But we went in on Utah Beach, and I don't know how it happened. We climbed down the rope ladders to get to our landing craft. And then the landing craft took us in and hit a rifle shot or a shell. But the initial invasion was over. And then we came in a, the next day, I guess it was, and landed. And three German, three German shoulders were coming down the, walking down the peninsula of Sherberg. And I don't know if they surrendered or we captured them. But uh, we, we took them, took their guns from them. A shell exploded on my hole, on my foxhole. And I had, white, I had phosphorus grenades, and I had them all. And I, after the shell hit, 
I put my hand, I looked at Cunliffe, I think he was dead. Because then I felt my leg, and I come up and I was all full of blood. And then I called the medics, and they came. And uh, I remember they carried me out on a stretcher right across the field where the Germans were shooting machine guns and they never shot a, shot around while they were carrying me across. Never, I was pretty, it was pretty nice of them. Soldiers were taught how to fight in basic training, but many learned additional on-the-job survival skills that saved their lives. Vernon Ratke fought in the brutal skirmishes in the Ardennes Forest in the Battle of the Bulge. I had some, I had some shrapnel come in my foxhole one day, but fortunately I, I had learned a little trick through a service manual that I had seen in the barracks back in the States, in which if you're in soft ground, Instead of digging straight down, you also dig sideways. And I did that. And I think that probably saved me because I did get some shrapnel in the hole. And there were a lot of guys that didn't do that. And unfortunately, they became casualties. That's one of the bad parts about being in the, in the trees. You get a lot of tree bursts and the shrapnel all comes down on top of you. So uh, that's probably about the closest thing that I can remember. Some Wisconsin soldiers buddied up with other troops from our state. Dave Meltzer found a friend from the dairy state in France. So we have a machine gun in our front farm field, and uh, uh, we were standing guard. My buddy, he was from Green Bay. He had unloaded wheat and coal up in Green Bay when he was a civilian. One morning, we are getting ready to go out on our assignment, and we hear machine guns going off in front of us, and all of a sudden we see a Messerschmitt coming up. So we all run out with our, our M we had carbines, we didn't have rifles, we were in the artillery, and the machine gun was all, and the plane got hit, not by us, but came over us and circled around and ended up at the end of the field in front of us, and. Of course, some of our guys went down and captured him, and then, of course, a few of them liked liked his the the gun that they had was was a trophy, you know. They liked at the time, yeah. We thought you know, we were saving the world because here was a guy who was took over all of Europe, and he was going to eliminate Great Britain, who who, by the way, were were really great great soldiers and wonderful people when we were there as soldiers. Same with Australia and then New Zealanders. I mean, those troops are wonderful. Our attitude was, you know, we have the opportunity to, to make the world uh, free and people can be people. In November of 2015, three Wisconsin veterans were presented with the French Legion of Honor Medal here at War Memorial for their distinguished service during World War II in Europe. John Wallen shares his thoughts about his experiences at the Battle of the Bulge. Very cold. I had these combat boots that was only a lifesaver I had. These big combat boots were just the same, same thing that the paratroopers wore. And I loved those things because they kept my feet warm. Did you have some close calls? Were you shot no, at? No, not no close calls. We were shot at, but uh, it was too far off. I built a bridge. Twelve of us had to go pick up this. We had a real long wood, wooden thing. Six guys on that side, six guys on this side. We lifted this thing up and put it right on uh, these pontoon. We had to get it up on top. and. Uh, do that, raise it, all of us lift them up, put them on the pontoon boat, 
and went across the Rhine. Before that, we knew that the uh, Germans had blown up their Rohr Dam. You know, they destroyed that, so we lost, lost a lot of people in that because when you get a combination of a dam so much full of water, plus all the water, the Rhine is a very deep river too. Down went across water. that bridge and then we started heading for, for the next town because we were traveling all the time. We were on the move all the time. Jesse Harrow fought at Normandy and at the Battle of the Bulge. Jesse told me he and the other troops in his unit were ready for action. We were anxious to, uh, to get into uh, any activities that they might, uh, might have, because sitting in the camp doing nothing all day long, sometimes it, it gets uh, boring. And so we were, we were ready for anything that came in front of us. When you guys invaded France, did yeah. you see a lot of guys who were shot and killed and wounded? No, no, no we didn't see none of that. The only time we saw that was when we were attacked and our own group uh, get involved or trying to uh, get away from the uh, from the firing uh, area that we were supposed to go into, but we avoid those orders, and we just uh, crawl on our on our stomachs, get away, and get in some kind of a uh, uh, group uh, situation. So then you were in the Battle of the Bulge, right? How was that? Was that it, tough? It was rough. Yeah. It was rough. Do you remember anything about it? There's too much to remember. Joseph Summers arrived at Normandy right after D-Day and was part of the American forces slugging their way through France's back country. We've seen all of the D-Day destruction and the trucks that were still in the water and tanks were in the water and they hadn't been brought ashore yet. Well, then we got on land and went into our first phase of fighting in the hedgerows in France. And it was very difficult because you had height, width, and length of the hedgerow, poor observation, and you did mostly small arms fire and hand grenades were used to get at the enemy. Well, we got through the hedgerows and we captured quite a few enemies, enemies and we sent them back to the rear lines uh, as prisoners of war. We went across in 12-man boats loaded with ammunition and weapons. And the Germans on the other side had uh, machine guns and artillery that were directed at us and they fired at our boats and some were lost. <clears throat> well, we did lose, we had casualties from that experience. We were all out doing security work in the back of the fort, the side of the fort, the front of the fort. And the forts were, I would say, 15 inch thick concrete. When they built something, they built it to last forever. And <clears throat> that afternoon, at three o'clock, two tremendous explosions came about. They had everything wired with high explosives. And the fort blew from the inside out toward us, and we were out in the front of the fort, and it got all of those that were inside of the fort looking for enemy uh, materials, and it got those people in the rear of the fort. And uh, let's see, eight of us were killed in action and 47 were wounded. I was one of the wounded, I was in front. Chunks of concrete just blew. This had to be a, tons of explosives that were in these forts. There were six or seven forts. 
And uh, that happened, and we were laying in our spot because this concrete just came out and flew in huge chunks and clouds of concrete, of uh, cement or concrete were formed, and we couldn't breathe. And uh, I was totally unconscious, and they set up a, a battalion medical aid station in Metz that we had just taken. And uh, they set that up, and we were taken there. And I guess later that afternoon, I came too. And uh, uh, it was a terrible experience. But uh, after that, I, we were in the Third Army, and that was George S. Patton's army. And he was the kind of guy, he'd be there at a jump off when we left. Very excellent posture, big, tall man. And he, uh, he would tell us, you know, don't lay in the field and dig a trench to lay in. Take that next city, take the next city, take the next city. That was his way of operating. Telling you, I was in the hospital for a few days, and all of those with good arms and good legs and mobility, he had given an order that they should be taken out and sent back to their units and combat which I went out and those that were ready to go went out and uh, once again got back in combat and took a lot more cities in France, liberated them, and then went into Germany and liberated those cities. My Grandpa Joe is the best guy I know. He fought in World War II for me and for you. When I look at our flag and I think of Grandpa Joe and the freedom he fought for so long ago, I love being free, I love being me, I love Grandpa Joe. John, Jesse, and Joseph were presented with their French Legion of Honor medals in a special ceremony at War Memorial Center in November of 2015. Surrounded by friends and family, the men were decorated by the French ambassador who came to Milwaukee for the occasion. The French Legion of Honor is an order of distinction established by Napoleon Bonaparte in 1802. These Wisconsin veterans are now among the distinguished group of foreign nationals who received medals for their service in France, joining the company of Generals Dwight David Eisenhower and Douglas MacArthur. Willie McLean was a member of the Montford Marines, the only African-American Marines unit in World War II. He served bravely at Iwo Jima. But like many African-Americans, when Willie returned home, he faced a different battle against racism in his native Arkansas. We were there at Honolulu, and uh, that Marine base was right over there, just opposite of uh, the, uh, where they, them Japanese bombed all them things at. And we stayed there, we, we did some training there, and uh, we uh, were on the LST, because that's what we went in on when we went down to uh, the battle there at Iwo. It was the toughest battle I think ever was, I really believe that, because, uh, you know, uh, the time that they bombed that place, we thought it was going to, everybody thought it was going to be just a few days, two or three days, you know. But uh, it wasn't, th they had it well fortified, and we saw that after we got there. They had those pillboxes from one side of the, the, the thing to the other, you know, like that. It, it was something. And uh, then uh, we got out there, and, and we was going, you know, uh, my, my uh, group, and the uh, uh, Japanese threw a, a hand grenade at us, you know, and come, uh, one guy was over on that right side of me, and I was over here. We saw him when he threw it, and uh, this guy, uh, when he threw that, uh, he, he, he just got ready for it. And when that bomb, that uh, grenade got there, he didn't try to take it and throw it. He just scooped it right back at that Japanese. and. and and kill him, it tore him up. It hit him right in the stomach and just tore it up. Yeah, really. So, 
Uh, that was awful. When I got out, I got married, and I, 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 I bought some land, and I, I built a house. And uh, when I built the house and bought the land and everything, I had to go down and pay my taxes. And I went down to pay my taxes, and when I went to pay them, I went over to register to vote. And uh, uh, the, the, the register there told me, he said, well, he said, I can't help you boys. He said, but we're going to have to wait to see what they're doing in Little Rock, what they're going to do in Little Rock, Arkansas. He said, and then we'll know what to do, you know. I said, well, how long do we have to wait? He said, I don't know. Your guess is good as mine. And then he left. Uh, we left from him and went back and got in line to pay our taxes. And he went over to the sheriff and got him and pointed us out to him, you know. And he come over there and he got us, you know. And he said, he looked, come over there and, and looked at us, me and, and me and another guy who was my, my brother-in-law. He said, what's the matter with you niggas? Do y'all want to be white? I told him, I said, that's out of the question. I said, we, we, I said, we want to vote, register and vote. We don't fought for this country, and then we come back and can't vote. Well, I can't help you boys, he said, no. Nah. He, he said, and then he took us over by his, his office, and, and uh, he, he gave us a shellacking, and, you know, and pulled, he had a gun hanging up one side, and, one, and, and I got in between one of them, and my brother-in-law got in between the other one, and then he looked, and he kind of calmed down, you know. He stopped calling us niggas then and calling you boys, yeah, he said. <laughs> and, uh, but anyhow, that's how it happened there. And uh, I never got to vote until I come to Wisconsin. And I, I enjoyed that. I've, I've been here ever since. Medal and Honor, The Greatest Generation is part of the War Memorial Center's Veteran Story Project. Dave Drent, the War Memorial's Executive Director, talked about the importance of recording this oral history. We hope to, to get as many stories from World War II veterans and then Korean and then down the road Vietnam and then our new veterans. Um, we only have about 26,000 26, um, World War II veterans left in the state of Wisconsin. Um, so I think it's imperative that we get as many of those stories on tape as we can. For more information on the Veteran Story Project and how you can participate, visit WarMemorialCenter.org. Among all of the horror of some of the most intense fighting in the Second World War, there were still some lighter, funnier moments. Bernard Bythel describes a situation that became awkward during the time he was stationed in England. And uh, being there six months, you, 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 in the evenings, you go into town to the, pub, the pubs or the French cafes and that, there was, there was nothing wrong with that. Many of the GIs, or I should say, a certain number of the GIs, did get uh, familiar with the uh, 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 <laughs> the uh, where was I? Oh, with, 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 yeah, with, with the British ladies. Okay. And they got very familiar with yeah. the British ladies. ladies. Well, anyway, they, to the fact that they would stay overnight with the British ladies. And uh, there, was, there was no curfew so long as they were there for reveille the next morning. Well, that was perfectly all right. But uh, the, the British 8th, 8th Army that was fighting in North Africa, well, they brought them home one night on leave. And uh, they landed them, and they put them on a troop train, and they went up, to, up dropping the men off where, where they, the towns where they lived. Well, they got into Cheltenham, you know, midnight to couple, one o'clock in the morning. So when they got home, some of them found GIs <laughs> with their wives or girlfriends. <laughs> and this was a battle in Cheltenham. <laughs> it's not in the record book. <laughs> Don Whitaker told us how his musical talent came in handy during his experience in Europe. When I was first assigned in the um, infantry, they 
gave me some training in what they call a scout. Well, then I found out the scout is the, scout is the first one out there looking for things. My eyes at that time were 2,600. I couldn't even see the enemy, let alone find out where they were. And then the company I was assigned to, they had a lousy bugler. I sent home for my cornet and practiced bugle calls when I knew the captain was in his office. And so after a certain length of time, first sergeant came over and says, the captain wants to see you. I said, okay. So then he said, you know all these bugle calls? I said, which one do you want to hear? Because I knew all 18 of them. And he said, you're the new company bugler. He takes your place on the machine gun squad. So I was happy. We had one other guy who was not very happy. So <laughs> I was in the band by the time we went overseas. So I, it was, my motto was I'm willing to do my service, but I, did, I wanted to see what I could do to come back. Not a bad motto. So it was better than the scout, I tell you. <laughs> Marge Pinky Balin was a nurse in the U.S. Army, where she worked with many doctors, real or imagined. I just remember a couple of patients, and I was, I believe I was the youngest nurse in that unit. That was the 199th General Hospital. And there was a young patient there who, uh, my patient, I was assigned to work with four patients, and he was one of them. He always wanted me to take care of him first, and he wanted me to take care of him last. <laughs> he just, he kind of, and I don't think he wanted me to take care of anybody else. <laughs> he, he was so loyal. <laughs> and there was another patient there who was very, very funny. And he, he would make rounds and pretend he was the doctor. And he was on crutches. And he stopped at one bed and he said to this patient, you know what? My grandpa died when he was 105. And five years after he died, he looked better than you do right now. <laughs> Robert Mizey was on the Marshall Islands when the first atomic bomb was dropped on Japan and never saw action in the Pacific. Bob told me joining the Marines paved the way to a great life. They afforded me an opportunity to go to college and go to law school. And when I finished law school, I came back, took the bar examination. I had some money left over and I decided to make the grand tour of Europe. Well, it was in August of 1952 when I got on a board a ship in New York City going for England. And on this ship, I met this lovely girl and she turned out to be my wife. And she was a New Yorker but she wanted to come back with me to Milwaukee. So she did come back. We got married and we came back to Milwaukee and I continued to practice law. And we've been married now for 56 years and we're living together in the Catholic home. So anything that was good in my life, I can trace back to my tour of duty in the Marine Corps. Historically, soldiers engaged in combat are the most celebrated in any military triumph. But for every two soldiers on the front lines, there is one soldier in an equally vital role of support behind the scenes. Joe Klusarek was part of a U.S. Marine support unit in the Pacific in radio radar, keeping open vital lines of communication. Every day we went through the radio and the radar of every plane with 24 planes in the squadron. So my crew that I had, radio radar crew, and myself, we went through every plane to make sure that that pilot would have communications with all of the other pilots in the squadron, and of course, most important, with the skipper of the squadron, and communications with our ground unit. We had a portable ground unit, and uh, I had an operator 
in that ground unit that was in communications then with the planes as they were in the air and with the skipper. So that was, that was my job with, with my crew that I had of keeping communications open. And we used to change frequencies every day. Otherwise, the Japanese could tie in to what our frequencies were, what we were telecasting at o over there. So we changed frequencies all the time. So in every plane, we used to change the frequency so they couldn't hone in on our, on our frequencies. And I'd sit on the plane, and then my other crew members would sit in other planes, and we'd make sure we could communicate with one another. And I usually sat in the lead plane, the skipper's plane. His was the most important. We had to make sure that communication was 100% with the, with the skipper. And uh, then he could communicate with the ground unit, and he could communicate with all of the pilots. Julian Plaster had one of the most difficult and emotionally challenging jobs in the Pacific Theater, burying soldiers who were killed in action. The stink was terrible. And uh, bodies out there in the South Pacific, the humidity and the heat, you know, they would blow up. And it was like picking up uh, dead pigs or, or animals, you know. Uh, maybe they'd fall apart. And uh, you're very nauseated. Uh, I think all of us that was in there, we lost a lot of weight because we couldn't eat. Uh, but that stink stayed with you. Ugh, it was terrible. Uh, it wasn't so bad there because I didn't know these guys. But uh, about two weeks later, after we landed on there and were loading our supplies, uh, the Japanese come back and uh, they hit our ammunition dump. And Roy Island is flat. You and I could run across it in about four or five minutes. And we thought the island was going to sink because it, all our ammunition and there was no place to hide. You just, the, the bombs were just blowing off. And um, the one tent that, tent that, uh, that I was in, there were six of us. The next day there was only three. That was emotionally uh, disturbing when I had to go and uh, pick up somebody that you knew, somebody that you'd been with for a couple of months. And uh, it, st it stays with you. We hope you've enjoyed Medal in Honor, The Greatest Generation. This program is part of the War Memorial Center's Veteran Story Project. Our project is ongoing. If you are or if you know someone, a Wisconsin veteran of any war, we would love to hear from you and continue to record these important stories as part of our oral history archive. For more information on our project, please visit warmemorialcenter.org. We conclude our program tonight hearing more from Julian Plaster, who moments ago shared his stories of burying the dead in the Pacific. Julian wrote a poem about war, death, and survival, entitled, The Old Man. The old man remembers. The old man is no more. The temple is crumbling. The old man looks back at his walk through the battlefield of life. The old man never, never dodged the opportunity to serve his country. The old man remembers stepping into the battlefield of war. The old man remembers the bombs of anxiety, fear of losing a friend. The old man remembers coming home to face more challenges of taking a partner, being a parent, a neighbor. The old man dodges the bombs of deceit, hatefulness, discrimination, unemployment. Again, the bombs of losing a friend, a loved one. The old man can't dodge the bomb of his temple. The old man is no more in his temple. The temple is crumbling to the dust from which it came. The old man's temple is no more, but wait. The spirit of the old man springs forth as a flower from the dust. 
the spirit of the old man will flourish because it is being cared for in his God's garden. The spirit of the old man will now find peace and contentment. The temple of the old man is gone, but the spirit of the old man lives on because of the living care in his God's garden. Amen. <laughs>